Oh, reading an inscription is easy as long as you already know what it says. <laughs> and it's, it's true, um, and it's very true. What's a day on one of the most exciting and famous archeological sites in the world? Let's take a tour with the man running the show at the Athenian Agora. Hello, this is Anya Leonard, founder and director of Classical Wisdom, a site dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. You can now find us along with our free newsletter at classicalwisdom.substack.com. Today I'm speaking with John K. Papadoulopoulos, distinguished professor of archaeology and classics at UCLA in California and the newly appointed director of the Athenian Agora Excavations. But before we begin, a quick thank you to our Classic Wisdom Society members who make all of this possible. If you'd like to become a member and help support our work, please go to classicalwisdom.substack.com and click subscribe. Now, on to the Athenian Agora. Okay, well, first, I'd like to congratulate you on your recent appointment as the Director of Excavations at the Athenian Agora, which is very exciting news. And I really want to get into the details of the excavation and, and about the archaeology that's happening over there. Um, but first, I think we could do a quick recap, um, a short history of the Athenian Agora itself to catch up everyone to speed. Well, thank you. Thank you for... Uh for interviewing me. Um, the Athenian Agora is one of the oldest and largest excavations of the American School of Classical Studies uh, at Athens. It began in 1931, um, and it's continued with only uh, a break, really, for the Second World War uh, ever since. Um, and it's, it's also been one of the one of the fabulous opportunities for a lot of young Americans, graduate and undergraduate students to be trained in archeology. span um, And, you know, this has really been uh, the brainchild of some of my predecessors, particularly Professor John Camp. Um, so um, I think the best way of recapping the history is, is really talking about the early directors. Uh, the first director, T. Leslie Shear, was a, an administrative dynamo. I mean, the guy had the wherewithal to purchase 360 something houses. It's, I, think, I think the figure is 366, if I'm not mistaken, to demolish in order to dig for the Agora. Uh, so I'm really standing on the shoulders of giants. I mean, Homer Thompson, who took over after the Second World War, really saw the excavations through a very difficult period. He was the one responsible for building, re refurbishing, um, renovating, reconstructing the store of Atlas and making it into the Agora Museum. Uh, T. Leslie Shear Jr. Uh, made some really important contributions uh, and discoveries, not least of which was the Stoa Basileus, the royal stoa, where you know Socrates had to present himself to the Archon uh, to see if there was enough evidence against him. And my predecessor, John Camp, um, really had that wonderful ability um, to synthesize. I mean, his book on the Agora, the overview of the Agora of Athens, his books, in fact, um, together with his The Archaeology of Athens, are sort of textbooks. And he has that wonderful ability to be able to synthesize this huge body of information and really make it uh, accessible to a much larger um, public. So I'm really like this midget that's standing on these shoulders of giants, uh, which is which is great. And so the site itself, uh, what's all included and what what was the importance of it historically? Well, the site, the site was always what was really important. And um, this is what the the early excavators were after. What they really wanted was digging democracy. Uh, they wanted to find the, the home of the radical democracy. Um, 
And, and it was both the center of the radical democracy of Athens in the fifth century BC. Um, it's where many of the important public buildings uh, were located. Um, but it was also, of course, the commercial economic center. It's where the marketplace was. So if you actually go to the sort of smelly markets, uh, particularly the fish market or the meat market today in Athens, that gives you a sense of what it must have been like. You could just about find anything there. Um, and it was also an area that was bounded by public buildings that many of them built by some of the most important of the statesmen of the, of the of the radical democracy. I mean, the painted stoa was built, you know, with funds from Kimon's uh, victories, uh, particularly up north um, and following the Battle of Eurymedon in southern Turkey. Um, so there were these wonderful buildings and, you know, the Stoa Poikili was where the, the Stoics got their name from. I mean, this is, um, you know, where this whole school of philosophy set up. So it was a public square. It was a zokolo. It was, it was this wonderful place where people met, interacted and bought all sorts of stuff. It, it, it truly is a, an astonishing point in history, you know, uh, to be able to maintain and still have the tangible location of this such a storied history. It, it's stunning. What happened before 1931? What was the excavations like a thousand years ago? Yeah, this is actually one of the most exciting aspects of it. Um, in the area that I'll be focusing on, um, it was a, a it was a building, a modern building, that was purchased thanks to funding by the Packard Humanities Institute and uh, Mr. David Packard. Um, and we just finished demolishing it. And essentially, um, you know, I have to walk over it because I'm still in LA. It was just demolished a few weeks ago. Uh, I have to walk over it to, to, you know, confirm a few things. But once we're down below the basement of these modern buildings, we're, we're in the middle or even late Byzantine period. And from there down, it's everything to various phases of the Bronze Age, um, you know, with a lot of the earliest remains on the banks of the Eridanos, uh, which, which actually, you know, used to run, the river Eridanos used to run through this area, uh, through the northern part of this area. And on the banks of the Eridanos, the earliest remains really go back to Middle Hellatic. I mean, we're talking about 2000, 2200, down to 1600 BC. So it's not just, um, you know, the early Iron Age, the Bronze Age, the classical, the archaic, the Hellenistic, the Roman but it's the late antique, the Byzantine and post-Byzantine. It's been, you know, um, it's one of the most, in the middle Byzantine period and, and throughout most of the Byzantine period and for parts of the later Roman period, it's one of the most important domestic quarters we have of Athens. We know more about, uh, and this is thanks to the wonderful work of our Byzantinists for the Nikonvili, uh, at the University of Virginia uh, and her students. Uh, it's just fabulous um, to, to get this sense of what life was like during all of these uh, different periods. And is it difficult to try to sort out which time period you're digging through or is it pretty obvious right away? Um, it's a little bit of both. <laughs> it depends on um, it depends on the stratigraphy. Um, the good thing about the agora is that the processes of the archaeological site formation were pretty straightforward. It was, you know, basically, um, you know, it's like a Near Eastern tell almost. I mean, it's it's one phase above an earlier phase above an earlier phase, and it goes down pretty pretty much like that. Um, the site where I've been digging re most recently up at Methoni in Pieria in Northern Greece, 
um, it's, it's famous for having been destroyed by Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great. And it was in the siege of Methoni that he lost his right eye. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, we were still trying to find it, but we never did. I can imagine it's one of those fields where sort of interdisciplinary backgrounds might be incredibly helpful, like having somebody who's a geologist or having somebody who's a linguist or, you know, all these sort of different elements so that they can see something of, well, this, that explains that. And you have to kind of problem solve from very different angles at time. Oh, yeah. And there's a whole slew of people that have been working with us. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Takis Karkanos, who's the director of the Wiener Lab at the American School of Classical Studies, which is a scientific lab. He's a soil micromorphologist. He actually runs a course for graduate students there. And he also, I've asked him to teach our undergraduates and volunteers to give them a uh, 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 an introduction to his techniques. I want to do some LIDAR and a little more geomorphology and geophysics. Um, uh, Particularly, there was some really wonderful coring work that was done by Al Ammerman and his collaborators in the past that really did determine where the the flow of the Eridanos River was. Uh, And that's really exciting because the Stoa Poikili, one corner of it, was actually in the river. And in order for that to happen, they had to re-canalize, re-channel the river in the classical period, which they did. Um, There, you know, I've got, you know, I've been, I've embarked on a huge um, project uh, with my colleague and friend, Brian Damiata, uh, to date, Um, all the late Bronze and early Iron Age burials using human bone collagen uh, through AMS uh, C14 radiocarbon dating. We've actually analyzed, um, you know, it's it's just on 100 samples. We've done three quarters of them um, to get an absolute chronology um, of the late Bronze and early Iron Age period through human bone collagen. Uh, using radiocarbon dating. You know, we have a full-time conservation uh, conservator and she has interns. Um, And then of course, we have the specialists who do all the different, you know, types of pottery, people like Susan Rotroff, who's the doyen of the study of Hellenistic pottery, Kathleen Lynch, who does much of our uh, archaic and classical pottery. And then those, you know, those inscriptions that are so hard to read sometimes, you know. I mean, there's no word breaks in Greek inscriptions. And, um, you know, the great Eugene Vanderpool, who was one of the Agra fellows back in, in, the, in the 40s and 50s, and basically spent all of his life in Greece uh, and died in Athens. And he had a wonderful estate, a house in Picardy. Um, Eugene Vanderpool once famously, famously said, Oh, reading an inscription is easy as long as you already know what it says. <laughs> and it's, it's true. Um, and it's very true. So I have to ask what kind of is a day in the life on the excavations? I think previously people had this sort of concept of, as we were saying before we started, uh, of uh, Indiana Jones and the sort of element of archaeology or just sitting in the desert with a brush for a long time. But it sounds like that's not really what it's like anymore. Well, it's early mornings. It's hot, hot weather, because particularly in the center of Athens, you're in the center of a bustling city with all of the things that that means in terms of air quality and what have you. Uh, You're in a deep pit. Um, It can get to 40 degrees Celsius. uh, And we stop when when it gets into the high 30s. Um, And, you know, we start early. We begin at 7. And we tend to finish around 2-ish or so. Uh, But we have an indoor staff and an outdoor staff. Uh, We have volunteer excavators. Um, and we have, of course, supervisors who keep the notebooks and who, who are training uh, the volunteers. So it's, it's, it's early morning rises. It's painstaking work. It's slow. 
Um, because the thing about archaeology is to dig is, is not a God-given right. It's a privilege and a great pleasure. And the fact of the matter is that once you dig it, you've destroyed it. So if you don't record it properly with all the tools at your disposal, you're actually damaging the historical record. And that's something that we really have to be careful about. Is there ever a time that you think I should have just left it there? Oh, yeah. In the past, yes, many times. Um, uh, you know, it just happens because, and that's how you live and learn, um, by making mistakes. We're not perfect. And uh, there have been many times where, you know, in hindsight, I had wished I had dug a context at sites that I worked at previously um, differently, but you don't get that chance. No, it's it's a, a once time every time. <laughs> But if you record carefully enough, the good thing is you can reconstruct. And that's that's really the important thing. So if you've got a good um, photographic record, photogrammetry, drawing, um, you've taken really careful elevations, you can really reconstruct a lot and say, well, this is where my mistake was. And this is what I should have done. And this is probably what it's doing. So you can reconstruct after the event. I feel that. like, I think there's like a bigger lesson in that as well. Um, but what would you say is some of the most exciting finds that you've had or surprising discoveries? In the Agora or generally? Uh, let's start with the Agora. Um, well, the Agora, you know, the, the really exciting thing is basically what I started talking about before. The fact that you've got everything from the Bronze Age. I mean, we have Mycenaean chamber tombs. We have early Iron Age burials. We have wells of all these different periods where people have thrown all this rubbish in where, when the well has become disused. These are time capsules. And because they're anaerobic, which is just a big word that means with little oxygen around, um, organic material is really well preserved. Um, you know, these are wonderful time capsules. So the really exciting thing about the Agora is really, is really giving us this palimpsest of all these different um, periods. Now, if, if, if you're asking what's the most exciting single find, well, Fortini Condili will tell you what her most exciting find was in terms of the Byzantine pottery. Susan Rotroff could tell you what the most exciting and precious thing was for her for the Hellenistic period. I can talk about the early Iron Age because um, that's what I've been publishing in the past. Uh, Kathleen Lynch can tell you about the archaic and classical period. You had mentioned previously that you've been you've worked on lots and lots of archaeological sites all around the world. Um, which were some of the most exciting of the other ones besides the Agora? Well, the ones that I co-directed projects um, uh, was uh, uh, prehistoric, uh, late Bronze, early Iron Age burial tumulus in Albania, the site of Lofkent, and we published a massive two-volume book on that. That was 2004 to 2008. Uh, from 2012 onwards, I've been co-directing uh, the Ancient Mathoni Archaeological uh, Project with Sarah Morris at UCLA and with Mateos Bessios, Athena Thanasiado, and Konstantinos Nulas of the Greek Ministry of Culture. Um, this is, of course, where, you know, Philip, this was the site that Philip destroyed, a wonderful, uh, and because of the destruction, it was bad news for the Mithenaeans, but it was great for archaeology because you dig and you're in archaic levels. There's no later remains on it. You're into these incredible early periods just straight off the bat. Um, so it's, 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 really, it's really exciting. Um, and then um, I was also involved in the repatriation of the Francavella Maritima project. This was material that was looted 
from the extramural sanctuary of Sibaris um, at Franca Villa Maritima in Northern Calabria. Uh, and this was an international project involving the J. Paul Getty Museum, uh, the University of Bern, the Nie Carlsberg Glittertech in Copenhagen, and the Italian Ministry of Culture. Um, and this was a really wonderful project because we actually, um, because there were also systematic excavations at Franca Villa Maritima, we were able to make joins between pottery found in the systematic excavations with that looted at the Getty Museum or in Bern wow. or in or in Copenhagen. So it was a real, it was a real wonderful project. Thanks to the good services of Piero Guzzo uh, and our Italian colleagues. Um, but you know, the place that I really loved in Greece the most was my first excavation at Toroni in Kalkiviki. Um, I just fell in love with the place. Um, and it was a pristine landscape because the modern road down to Chalkidiki, down to the bottom of the second peninsula of Chalkidiki, was only really opened in the 70s. Uh, and the excavations began by my one of my supervisors, Alexander Kambitoglu, in 1975. Uh, and I started there in, in the late 70s. Um, and I worked there from, you know, 79 to 95. Um, eventually becoming the deputy director and the field director of the excavations. Um, but actually, I learned my trade by digging in Australia. It was on Aboriginal sites. Um, and in fact, when I was um, an undergraduate, I would have been very happy to continue working um, in Australia for the rest of my life. Uh, I just loved Aboriginal uh, rock art. Uh, it, it, it was just so stunning. And also being in, in the landscape um, and, and listening to Indigenous people talking about their landscape. But then as an undergraduate, I was invited to go to Tironi. Um, I got to Greece. It was my first ever visit to Greece. I had never been before. Uh, even though I'm a Greek citizen and I speak fluent modern Greek um, because I couldn't speak a word of English until I went to school in Australia. Um, I, it was just so eye-opening and it was just so much fun being there that I thought, mm, this is great. Yeah, that's quite a journey and uh, quite a roundabout journey back to Greece in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from Australia and then Greece and then Italy, then Albania, then back to Greece. Yeah. Well, there is quite a fun. large Greek population in Australia. It's really an old saying that you're not really a Greek unless you have one relative, however distant, in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Melbourne, which is not where I'm from, I was born and bred in Sydney, but Melbourne is actually the third largest population of Greeks after Athens and Thessaloniki. Yeah, I can believe it. I, I can believe it. It's amazing. <laughs> um, now, I, I've got to ask, if there was anywhere in the world that you could work on, no red tape, any technologies all available, limitless funding, what would be your, your dream archaeological site? Where do you think the, the greatest treasures lie? I, I, I sort of want to throw that question back to you or a related question and say, what is a treasure? What do you consider a treasure? Well, I mean, I remember thinking about this when talking again about the Battle of Actium. And I think it was William Murray was saying, you know, they had, they had, they, the waters were clear at one point and they could just look down and see like cannonballs and they were really excited to dig in there but then there had been some construction where they had dealt with some pipes and the whole bay got muddied and just buried under silt and it was like just to think that we would be able to learn so much we could see these boats find out all this technology that was 
with being employed by Cleopatra's naval forces and Octavian's, and just to, to think that that's just right there, but not in our grasps yet. I, I always thought, well, that would be that would be a great. Well, that's a, that's actually a really good example, and that's in many ways. And you know, I share a lot with my friend Bill Murray. You know, I, I admire his work and and the work of Constantino Zachos, who was the director of the Actium. Uh, the recent excavations at the uh, Tropeon, the uh, the monument of Augustus. Um, you know, a treasure for me is learning about something in the past that we didn't know before. So, if 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 there was no red tape, unlimited funds, I would issue a warning, which is be careful what you wish for. Um, and if I had it my way, if I was given that opportunity, what would I do? I would go back to Tyrone. I would go to the place I first fell in love with. Um, you know, and where I spent or misspent so much of my youth. Uh, I'll, I'll have to check it out myself. Uh, I'd love to go up there and, and oh, have a look. Oh, there's no finer beach anywhere in Greece. You know, this sounds like a challenge that I am going to accept. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, just to, to finish up on the Agora still, um, how can folks get involved in the project, whether to visit, to support it, volunteer? Uh, how, how can people Well, pursue? we've just announced, I can send you the link uh, for volunteers. Um, you know, precedence is given to graduate and undergraduate students in, in various programs. Uh, but we take students from all over the world. Um, and, and, and this year, because the area that we're digging is circumscribed, it's gonna be a little smaller than what has been dug in the past. So there'll be fewer um, students, but um, so they're, they're, we, we do get uh, a lot of applications, uh, and we've now put a committee in place to to read through those uh, applications. So it's not just me making the choice, um, and and so that's one way. Um, but even last summer, with you know when I was transitioning with John Camp, the, the my predecessor, I was just. Um, amazed by how many pours of the agora we had to give. And there were two of us. Um, and there were some days that John could do it and there were some days that he couldn't. Um, and so I took over and, um, you know, then there was, you know, potential donors that could only do it on a Sunday afternoon. So, you know, it's a it's a 24 seven sort of position. So we go out of our way. Um, any university or school group. Um, I actually gave uh, a wonderful tour to. Um, it was a Greek. Um, it was a Greek consortium of various different schools, a summer camp, and their teachers brought all these students, and they were aged between six and twelve. The six-year-olds were all. They all just came because I was the leader, as it were and held my hand. I mean, it was, it, was, it, was, it was the most wonderful experience. And all these little kids, and I took them inside the Hephaestion and took them around the, the, the Agora. Um, and then, you know, my, you know I, I, I got my, you know, members of my staff, um, especially Aspasiev, Stathil, uh, to give them a little lesson. We have some uh, replicas of antiquities, not real antiquities, but replicas. So we could hand them out to the students and then have a little lesson in the store of Atlas. Um, but people can just get in touch with, you know, either the school or with me directly or with the Agora staff directly. Um, we give student groups, uh, prefer professors, people in, you know, who are classicists, tours. Um, I recently had uh, a gentleman who was um, uh, a, a former journalist who was writing a piece on democracy and really wanted a tour. And I was very happy to do that. And then we kept on 
um, you know, a whole tirade of email messages for weeks and weeks and weeks about details comparing the Athenian democracy to the American democracy. Uh, so, so it's it's very straightforward. Um, and fortunately, now I have a new assistant to the director, um, Dr. Irini Dimitriado, who will be based in Athens uh, all the time, and she, you know, she will be able to give tours uh, with us, Aspasia Estathio, uh, who's our registrar, um, you know, whenever whenever needed. Well, wonderful. Um, and I, I fear you're going to be seeing me and my daughter in the not too distant future. I'll be messaging you to make sure we get to have a look because uh, it's just such a treasure trove to be able to access. Um, and I love the idea of, of people from around the world getting to enjoy this sort of rich history and, and to get to bear witness to what you guys are doing there and, and what you're discovering. Yeah, and people love that this is, you know, the world's first democracy. And, um, you know, they really, they're, you know, just people who look over the fence to look at the excavation down where we're digging now, just north of Hadrian Street. And there was this older gentleman, and he was great. Um, and he was just, he was retired. And he said, this is the painted store, isn't it? And I said, yes. And he was so, like, there were almost tears in his eyes. I mean, he was, and, and, you know, when you see that sort of enthusiasm, um, you know, it's, it's uplifting. Uh, it's wonderful. Beautiful. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Please go to classicalwisdom.substack.com to learn more about our work and to sign up for our free newsletter. To learn more about John's work at the Agora, please go to the website agathy.gr. The link is below. Thank you.